Thank you all very much for inviting me here. My name is Dimitri Christakis. I'm a pediatrician and epidemiologist by training and um, currently based in Seattle, Washington, although I did my undergraduate work right here at the Sistine Institution, so it's very nice to, to be back. I should point out it's a very different city than it was 30 years ago, dramatically different. Um, so uh, I hopefully have time for questions at the end, and I don't think I need a microphone. Is that you true? Good. You're good. I'm good, so I can move around? Okay, great. Uh, all right, so we will get started. Um, as I said, I did my undergraduate work here a long time ago. I was actually an English major and one of my favorite mm -hmm. poets uh, from the turn of the last century. I'll understand now Yale undergraduates will no longer need to read Wordsworth, but, um, but back when I read him, this was a quote that stuck with me since then, um, which for people in the Yale Child Study Center is nothing new. You all know how important childhood is to, uh, to parenting and the experience of childhood, how they actually form the adults that we become. My laboratory's mission um, is to determine modifiable factors in children's early environment that can positively impact their cognitive, social, and emotional development, and to develop actionable strategies to optimize them. So that's a lot to, to digest and talk about. But um, in the two and a half hours, I think, that I have today to talk to you, I'll just focus on the cognitive. That was a joke, I know. <laughs> I'll just focus on the, on the cognitive aspect of the work that we do around early childhood experiences and, and brain development and cognition. So when I think of cognition, um, I think of kind of three components of what we call executive function. I, I suspect most of you are familiar with executive function. It's kind of the higher order processing that our brain does, and it, it's largely the work of the prefrontal cortex, which is the last part of the brain to develop, really not, not fully developed until kids or young adults are in their early 20s. So a sizable percentage of this campus is walking around without a fully developed prefrontal cortex. <laughs> but um, there are kind of three components to executive function. The first is self-control, which is the ability to stay focused on something and not be distracted by what's happening around you. The uh, second is working memory, which is the ability to hold information in your mind while you're working with it. And the third is cognitive flexibility, which is the ability to apply something that you learned in one context in another. Now, all three of these are incredibly important aspects of higher thinking, but uh, my own personal opinion, and I, I think that of some other experts at least, is that of the three of these, uh, self-control is the most important. And I, I will hopefully be able to show you why that is. Um, so here's, here's a question that says, find X. Um, and <laughs> the person says, here it is. Um, <laughs> I think that the, um, obviously this is, joke, but, but the, the, the willingness to sort of jump to this conclusion, uh, whether it was intended to be funny or not, is a sign of kind of lack of self-control, jumping to an answer and not actually thinking about what the question is actually asking. Probably almost all of you are familiar with the Stanford Marshmallow Test. I don't even need to, I'll cover it very briefly, but this is kind of a very cute study that got a lot of attention, still does, was done about 30 years ago, where researchers at, at Stanford brought preschool kids, three to five years of age, into a room in a lab and sat them down with one marshmallow in front of them and uh, told them that they could have one marshmallow now or if they waited two minutes, they could have two marshmallows. And they started a video player, uh, video even kids, and they left and they basically tacitly observed what they did. And only about 25 to 30 percent of kids were able to wait the full 10 minutes. And if you watch the videos, it's very funny to see what the kids do. Some of them you know, bite their finger while they look at the marshmallow. Some of them take a little pinch out of the marshmallow and turn it upside down to try to hide what they've done and distract themselves by looking away. But the interesting thing was that the longer children waited to eat that marshmallow, if they, if they waited at all, the better they did, not just in preschool and kindergarten, which may not be surprising because that's proximal, the better they did actually over their entire lives in terms of functioning. And I would argue that this is really a kind of cute measure of self-control. You have to stay focused on the task, which is not eating the marshmallow and not allow yourself to fall prey to your instincts uh, to either eat it or try to hide what you're trying to do when you do eat it. So that's a cute example. Uh, hasn't had much kind of rigorous evaluation. But there is actually probably the best study to done to date by Moffat and colleagues using the Dunedin longitudinal data. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. This is a birth cohort in New Zealand. Uh, there have been thousands of papers published on it. 
Um, they followed 1,000 children from birth to three, 30 years of age. It's obviously observational data, but it's very, very well controlled, and they have excellent follow-up. And I'll show you here just a few things, um, uh, a few adult outcomes. Um, and what you see here along the x-axis is childhood self-control. This is preschool children's self-control measured in quintiles from low to high. And then these are adult health outcomes. These are z-scores. And I show you here substance dependence, poor physical health, and socioeconomic status. Uh, I chose just three. They looked at 20. But the relationship in all of them was the same. You see a monotonic relationship. Better self-control early in childhood, better outcomes as adults. Um, and as I said, it, it would be true no matter what you looked at. So again, early child self-control, very important for, for long-term functioning and outcomes. Now, all of this happens in the context of, as I said, a maturing brain and early experiences. And, and you might ask, well, why do early experiences matter? Well, the typical newborn brain is 333 grams. And it triples in size in the first two years of life. So it's an extraordinary period of brain growth very early in life. And you're probably familiar with this, given your focus in the center. Um, in fact, if you look at brain growth over the lifespan, you can see just how steep the rise is early in life. And as I mentioned, it's not fully completed until about age 21, 22. And then, you know, George and others of us can find ourselves over on the right side of this uh, curve and see why we had such a hard time finding our car keys this morning. But, but the real focus isn't what happens over here for me. It's what happens over here with this very, very steep rise. And I'll try to put it sort of in an evolutionary perspective. So this here is a, a human infant. I think probably most of you are familiar with this creature. Probably less familiar with this creature, C. elegans. This is a, uh, a round worm. Um, so let's just do a very kind of brief comparison of, between these two creatures with respect to their brains. So the human infant has 100 billion neurons in, in, that, in that cranium there. And this round worm, by comparison, has 302 neurons. Interestingly, though, uh, the, entire, the entire human phenotype is set up by 20,000 protein coding genes. And actually, it's the exact same number for C. elegans, same number of protein coding genes. And in fact, almost every gene in humans that's uh, been found to be responsible for any kind of genetic disorder, those genes are also represented in this simple round worm. So in spite of the obvious incredible differences between these two creatures, there's a remarkable amount of similarity. The difference, of course, is I showed you the brain growth that happens in the human infant. That doesn't happen. C. elegans is born with his brain fully developed, all 302 neurons already functional. Its environment plays very, very little role in, in how that brain develops, which is definitely not true for humans. In fact, although well, traditional teaching was that we're born with a lifetime supply of neurons, that's now undergoing some rethinking. Uh, it, it does appear that there is some neurogenesis after birth, but the predominant number of our brain cells are present at birth. What changes for us and doesn't change for the roundworm is that we form connections between these brain cells, these synaptic connections, the myelination that happens in the brain. And and that kind of fine-tunes the world to the uh, fine-tunes the mind to the world that children inhabit. And to give you an example of this that everybody can relate to, uh, any child born anywhere in the world can learn to speak any language fluently. Uh, but if they're not exposed to certain sounds early in life, they can learn to speak a language fluently later, but they'll never pass as a native speaker. We all know people like that. Uh, we know babies born in China can learn to speak perfect Mandarin, as amazing as it is to me, because it seems such a difficult language. But if they don't hear English early in those first three to five years of life, they can learn to speak English later, but they'll never sound like a native speaker. They'll never be able to roll their R's. We all know such people. It's not because they weren't born with the capacity to roll their R's. It's because their mind in that critical period of brain development fine-tuned itself to an environment in which that sound didn't exist. And there was no reason to ever develop that capacity. So this is, re this is represented here. You can see in this schemata the neurons present at birth. And each one has about 1,500 synaptic connections with other neurons. And by three years of age, it's over 200,000 connections. And then at 15 years, there's a gradual pruning. So those early experiences, every experience a baby is having is firing a neuron, making a synaptic connection, if you will, kind of developing a very, very intense architecture, which is eventually kind of tuned to the world that the child is, is, is engaged with. Now, I show you here the 
to, to, to illustrate this another way, the breathing of a one-day-old infant listening to music. And you can see here that Mozart is playing, and then Stravinsky comes on, and then Mozart is played again. Now, I show you this not to present some kind of an infantile critique of classical music, although those of you who know Stravinsky might have a hypothesis for why <laughs> Stravinsky did this to this poor baby's respiration. I show this to you to demonstrate that there's a, a discernible physiological reaction from the very first day of life to what babies are hearing. This baby is distinguishing between the melodic sounds of Mozart and the somewhat chaotic sounds of Stravinsky and reacting to it. And we talked about executive function at the beginning of this talk. And again, executive function isn't fully completed until, really, until kids are seniors in, in college. But again, there's a very, very steep curve early on in the development of executive functional skills. Further evidence that this early period is so critical to developing that self-control, which will impact adult outcomes. So we talked a lot about early experiences. This is from uh, Adele Diamond's uh, Habits of the Mind curriculum, you might be familiar with it. It's a very simple game. It's called Walk the Line. You take a piece of tape and you put it down on a carpet and you tell a preschool child to walk it. And of course, doing so, you might think, uh, requires uh, physical coordination, which it does. But it also requires a fair amount of, 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 of cognitive capacity too, right? They have to exert their executive function and not be distracted, particularly if they're doing this in a busy preschool and there are children all around here commanding their attention. He has to stay focused on the line in front of him if he's going to be able to do this task. And of course, you can make the line longer, you can make it curved, you can do any number of things to further challenge him to maintain his <coughs> focus and not be distracted. And the traditional thinking is that these kinds of experiences early on in life can prevent you from eating the marshmallow <laughs> early and more importantly, <laughs> impacting your life over the long term. Now we've known for many years that too little stimulation early in life is really bad for brain development. I show you here two PET scans. For those of you that aren't familiar with PET scans, the, they're a measure of brain function, actually brain met metabolic function, and the brighter areas show our greater brain activity, darker areas, less brain activity. These are PET scans of two kindergarten children. This is a normal kindergartner. And on the right is a PET scan done from uh, one of the Romanian orphans. I don't know if you all are familiar with this group of kids. They've been studied extensively. This was a group of orphans in Romania that were profoundly neglected, that were essentially raised in darkness and closets with virtually no human interactions at all. And you see there, there are areas of this poor child's brain that show no activity whatsoever. In other words, because of that profound sensory neglect early in life, areas of her brain <coughs> haven't developed at all. So too little stimulation, very, very bad for brain development. But one of the questions we've had in our lab for some time is, what about too much? Is it possible to overstimulate the developing brain? Or put another way, is there appropriate types of stimulation in appropriate amounts that's good for brain development, and inappropriate, amount, inappropriate types and inappropriate quantities that can actually cause damage? Which leads us towards the current world you live in. This is go to your chat room. <laughs> The reality is that we've technologized childhood in a way that's really remarkable. In 1970, the average age at which children began to watch television, which was the prevailing media platform of the day, was four years of age, like this cute little girl here. And today, we know, based on research that we've done and others have done, it's four months of age. There's been a dramatic <coughs> shift in the age at which children begin to interact with screens. And most of this shift has not happened actually over the last 40 years. Most of it's happened over the last 15 to 20 years. There simply <coughs> weren't programs or devices that were intended for very, very young children. And that all began actually with the show we'll see in a few minutes of Baby Einstein. Now, this is based on research that one of my then postdocs did, looking at the amount of children's daily media consumption and you can see that it actually varies by where they spend their days during, uh, where they, whether they're, where they're in out-of-home care. Um, but uh, if you sum it all up, the typical, the typical preschool child in the United States spends about five to six hours a day in front of a screen of some kind. If you add home-based screen with child-based screen, child care-based screen. And the typical preschool child is only awake about 12 hours a day. So they're spending somewhere between 30 and 50% of their waking hours in front of a screen of some kind. And the question that we've had for some time is what is that doing to their brains? What is it doing to their cognitive development? And this brings us to Baby Einstein. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Baby Einstein. But um, this, is, uh, this is the 
this is the product that launched a thousand imitators, but uh, it's it's a three hundred million dollar industry, maybe Einstein itself, distributing these DVDs that are intended for babies. And I will show you here a random twenty second clip of a Baby Einstein Day on the Farm, which is meant for children six months of age and older. So in that 20 second clip, there were seven scene changes, right? One every three seconds. It's the most exhausting day on the farm since John Steinbeck's <laughs> Great Surprise. It's really nothing like being on a real farm, right? As adults watching this, your mind is trying to make a coherent narrative out of something that's completely discombobulated. And you can't. There's no sense to be made of this. It's completely random. But babies watching it aren't trying to make a coherent narrative out of it. They're not cognitively capable of it. What's actually keeping them engaged in the screen is all of that auditory and visual stimulation. That's all there is for them. Okay, that's all there is for you too, but you find it boring and you're trying to make sense of it and you can't. So this segues me into the sort of rise of ADHD, which I'm sure you're also familiar with. It currently affects by varying estimates about 10% of uh, US children. It's much more prevalent than it was 20 to 30 years ago. We've seen a distinctive rise in ADHD diagnosis, much like we have with autism. And I think as an epidemiologist, I think this reflects both an increase in the prevalence and clearly an increase in our ability to diagnose it or maybe even overdiagnose it. But I think most experts agree that there is more ADHD than there used to be. And we've known for a long time there's a genetic component to ADHD. I present here, I don't know, 20 odd studies looking at the heritability of ADHD. But when I sum all these up, I find there's a, that the heritability is about 75%. What does that mean? That means if two identical twins, if one identical twin has ADHD, there's a 75% chance that her sibling would. Right? And identical twins are genetically identical. So if it was completely genetic, we would expect that there would be 100%. So it's not completely genetic. And like most things today, we've come to realize that there is a nature-nurture mix, right? That there are candidate genes for ADHD, many of which have been identified and some of which are shown here. And there are a lot of environmental factors that have also been studied. And the combination of these things in some vulnerable fraction leads to sort of the clinical phenotype of ADHD that we're familiar with today. But I can tell you that, oh, let me just add this. So the Surgeon General himself said for most children with ADHD, the overall effects of these gene abnormalities appear small, suggesting that non-genetic factors also are important. Now, I talk about ADHD because it's a, it's a clinical entity that most people relate to quite readily, but in my lab, I don't use it. I think it's actually distracting. Um, and here's why. If you think of sort of attentional capacity, or let's just say executive function, which I began this talk with, in terms of there being a normal distribution, a normal curve, what we do in the case of ADHD as clinicians is what we always do. We draw a line at some point, typically at the 95th percentile, and say that if you're on this side of the line, you have a pathology. In this case, you have ADHD. And we medicate you, we change your environment, we do all kinds of things. We give you accommodations at school. And if you're at this side of the line, we say, no, you know what, you don't have ADHD. That's the good news. You don't meet the clinical criteria. But remember the graph I showed you on the Dineen data. There's a monotonic relationship between executive function and outcome. There's no threshold, right? It wasn't like it didn't matter at the first, second, third, and fourth quintile, and then all of a sudden, it shot up. So really, as, from a societal perspective, what we're interested in is shifting this whole curve as far over as we can, maximizing every child's ability to, to maintain focus, optimizing their executive function. And when we do these kinds of lines, which we do for all sorts of reasons which I'm happy to discuss, um, we not only don't recognize from a public health standpoint the importance overall of maximizing children's attentional capacity, but we actually do a disservice to the kids that live right here. So I frequently think as a clinician that paradoxically, this kid would have been better off if their parents had scored them one or two points higher and just kicked them over the line and suddenly they would get access to all kinds of services and medications that they're now being denied. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So many years ago, uh, we developed what we call the overstimulation hypothesis. And quite simply, it's this, that prolonged <coughs> exposure to sort of rapid image change during this critical period of brain development we've been talking about 
preconditions the mind to expect that high level of stimulation. And that leads to inattention later in life. Put another way, you watch enough baby Einstein as a baby, and then when you go to a farm as a seven or eight year old, it's boring. Nothing happens fast enough. Why do I have to walk there? Why isn't there a marionette suddenly popping out? Um, reality is underwhelming because the set points have been set so high. And um, we tested this some years ago in humans and found, in fact, that it's true that the more uh, television children watch early in life, the lower their attentional capacity was later. Notice I didn't say ADHD, I, we measured attentional capacity. And the more cognitive stimulation they received early in life, the higher their attentional capacity was. And we measured cognitive stimulation by how often parents read to their children, sing to them, take them to museums, the zoo, etc. <coughs> Specifically, for each hour of TV that children watched before the age of three, their risk of having attentional problems was increased by about 10%. And each hour of cognitive stimulation resulted in a 20% decreased risk in their having attentional problems. So a child who watched two hours of TV a day before the age of three, 20% more likely to have attentional problems compared to a child who watched none. Okay, if what we hypothesized was true, then you might imagine that what children watch matters. That it's not just the screen time, it's the pacing of the shows. And I showed you an example before of the baby Einstein. I'll show you another example of a fast-paced program. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the Powerpuff oh, yeah. Girls movie. Yeah. This is the opening sequence of the Powerpuff Girls movie. And again, you'll notice that the frequent scene changes and kind of fairly jarring music. Again, that's the opening sequence, and this is the first movie ever rated PG-13 for, or I'm sorry, PG for non-stop frenetic animated action. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making that up, that's the back of the box. Um, and I want to contrast that with something I know you've all seen, which is this. So, this is uh, a scene from Mr. Rogers. kind of invented reality TV. He's not credited with it. It's, it's not reality TV though, right? It's, I mean, the waitress says, I'm awfully busy today, but she doesn't seem the least bit hurried. And if anything, the pacing of this show is kind of soothing. It's like so really slow, certainly by, by today's standards. So um, very, very different experience, audio and visually watching this versus Powerpuff Girls movie. And in fact, when we repeat an experiment, um, or a study, I should say, uh, looking at what programs children watch, we saw dramatic differences in terms of their attentional capacity later. So shows like uh, Mr. Rogers didn't increase the risk of attentional problems. Entertainment shows like the Powerpuff Girls movies include, increased it by 60%. And violent shows, which I didn't show you, which are typically even more rapidly paced, increased it by over 100%. So again, sort of further evidence that this overstimulation might be driving the deficits in attention that we see in some kids. Now, all of these studies that I've shown you have been observational uh, for obvious reasons. I can't uh, ethically take babies from their parents and randomly subject them to hours of overstimulating shows <laughs> versus uh, not, and then follow them for, for seven years, as we did in these studies. So um, those of you that are very statistically inclined might rightly say, did you adjust for all of the possible confounders? And even though I would argue with you that we we did, or we tried to, or we did a very good job, certainly good enough to pass peer review at top tier journals. I cannot tell you that we did an experimental design, which is why several years ago we started building a mouse model at Seattle Children's Research Institute, because I can take mice 
and overstimulate them. So this is mouse TV. <laughs> and um, it's, it's kind of irritating, but um, <laughs> what it is basically is, uh, well, these are our mouse TV lounges. And there are, um, there are speakers up here, and they are photorhythmically activating lights uh, around the cages here. And the audio comes from the Cartoon Network, just to be cute. If you, if you, those of you that know mice know that they actually hear at a much higher spectrum than we do. So actually what they're hearing is not what you're hearing. If I played you what they were hearing, it will sound like squeaks, which you don't even realize are there when you're listening to, anyway, that's a separate conversation. But, but what we do is we put them in these TV lounges and we have them watch TV six hours a day for 42 days. So they spend their entire childhood watching television, not unlike some Yale undergraduates. But, um, so that's their experience, and then we, we look at their behavior 10 days later, and I, we do a whole bunch of assessments. I don't have time to show you all of them. I'll show you a couple. So the first is that we look at their activity and risk-taking, and we do that using what's called the open field test. And the way the open field test works is that you, you take a mouse and you put it in what passes as an open field in a laboratory, which is basically a black box, and there's some electrical tape you might be able to see here that defines the open <coughs> part of the field. And you let the mouse kind of wander around. And mice tend to avoid open fields. They have very few friends in the natural world. And all things being equal, they would rather stick around the periphery where it's safe. But they have kind of a competing foraging instinct because once this mouse convinces itself that there's nothing to eat around the rim perimeter, uh, he or she, I'm not sure which this is, will, will venture into the middle. And what we do is we exploit the fact that we have a white mouse on a black background, and we use a computer tracker to see uh, where the mouse spends its time. And you can see here, this is the mouse you were just looking at, and it spends most of its time, in fact, around the periphery. And this is another mouse, uh, and something might jump out at you about this mouse, is, um, how it spends its time in the open field. You'll notice both that it has a lot more activity, and in fact that it spends much more time in the open field than the other one. And when we compare kind of our control mice raised under normal laboratory standards to our overstimulated mice, both in terms of the amount of time they spend in the center and their entries into the center, you'll see that there are dramatic differences. So this overstimulation leads to mice that are hyperkinetic and non-risk averse or risk-taking mice. They're not scared to go into the middle of the field. And the second test I'll show you is what's called the novel object recognition test. And this tests short-term memory. The way this works, again, we go back to the black box. And we put the mouse in there with two objects. And we let the mouse explore the objects for 10 minutes. And we take the mouse out, and we replace one of the objects with a novel object, a different object, and put the mouse back in. And what you expect would happen is that the mouse will spend more time with the novel object than it will with the familiar object, right? It's already explored this one and knows that it's not a source of food. Uh, so if it recognizes that object, it's going to spend more time on the other one. And again, we're able to uh, track them the way we did before, and we have a novel and a familiar object, and then quantify the amount of time they spend with each one. So here what our control mice do. You can see they spend over 70% of their time with a novel object, just as you would hypothesize to, to happen. And this is what our overstimulated mice do. Uh, they spend the exact same amount of time. So they're they have no short-term memory. They're unable to distinguish. They don't give a shit. I don't know what <laughs> the difference is, but they don't function the way the control mice do uh, once they're overstimulated. OK. This is really more for the medical school crowd, but I'll throw it out there. We actually look to see like neurogenesis, like so this is like the, the creation of neurons, and what you see here, it's hard to see, but this is uh, antibody staining. And what, you, what we find actually very interestingly, these, these are sort of hot off the press, that you see less neurogenesis in the overstimulated mice than you do in the control. And it's really kind of a contrarian finding because everything I led you to believe before, everything I would have said, was that this stimulation kind of drives neurogenesis, but in fact, it seems to have the opposite effect. It seems that so, there's so much stimulation that, that the brain almost tries to counterbalance it by not developing more neurons. I'm speculating there. I don't know why we see this. It's not what we expected, but there's less neurogenesis in the overstimulated mice compared <coughs> to the control. Now, what else might media do early on in children's environment to affect their development? Um, 
I want to contextualize that by talking a little bit about the phenomenon of joint attention. I, you're probably familiar with it, but, but briefly what joint attention is, starting at about four to six months of age, a caregiver can direct the child's and infant's attention to something, and the baby will look there, and then instinctively look right back at the caregiver, right? Implicitly asking, mm. what is that? Tell me something about that. Beginning at about 10 to 12 months of age, uh, babies can actually direct caregiver's attention, and the same thing will happen. The baby will point, the caregiver will look, and then look back to the child, and there'll be a conversation around that. These sort of conversational turns happen hundreds of times, ideally, in a child's daily life. Most people aren't even aware that it's happening because it's so instinctual for a caregiver to do that. Uh, but it's incredibly important, not just to social development, but cognitive development as well. So several years ago, we did a study using what's called the Lena pro product. I don't know if you guys are familiar with using it in your research here. It's this digital language processor that's worn in a little pocket of a vest, and it records everything that a child says or everything that's audible at their chest. And Lena has this proprietary software that decodes it in, sorry, into uh, adult word counts, male and female, child vocalizations, these conversational turns, these back and forths we were just talking about, and of course television. It can distinguish television from these other uh, naturalistic human voices. And in this study, which was published a few years ago, we did kind of conditional regression. So each child served as their own control. So very robust design that way. We compared times when a child could hear TV to when that same child could not, and measured how many words they actually heard and said. So same child, right, within subjects comparison. And what did we find? Well, each hour of audible TV resulted in children hearing 656 fewer adult female words and 200 fewer adult male words. Now, how many words does a typical adult female say in an hour? <laughs> a million. <laughs> the typical adult female says 710 words in an hour. So this is about a 90% displacement of the no total number of words that a baby's hearing that, uh, compared to what they would otherwise hear. And how many words does a typical adult male say in an hour? I will caution you, it's a little bit of a setup. Those of you that are already thinking that you know the answer based on this. There's dead silence. No one wants to make these. There are very few males in this audience. <laughs> You're all on shaky ground. I can tell you, I've, I've presented these data all over the world, and there's, there's universal acceptance of the fact that women speak more than men. But I will tell you, in studies, not that I've done, that others have done, the typical adult male says 712 words an hour, so two words more than a typical adult female, not statistically significant. So men and women say the same number of words doesn't mean they listen to each other. <laughs> the reason you're seeing a difference here is not because men talk less than women, but men talk to babies less than women talk to babies. Mm -hmm. So actually the percentage displacement is exactly the same. It's just that men talk to the TV set instead of to the baby, and, and women would ta otherwise talk to the baby. Does that make sense? So, so this is deceptive, um, but, but nevertheless a real phenomenon, that there's a deprivation of words, male and female, uh, when babies can hear television. Now that's based on TV, and of course we now know that this phenomenon of sort of parental distraction extends far beyond traditional media, the sort of phenomenon of distracted parenting. And here, if you look at, at this scenario here, um, this is an opportunity for joint attention instead of a selfie, but, but the selfie is sort of predominating the, uh, the, the adult human uh, interaction. So this, this date um, probably is lost on most of you, but it's important because it actually was the date that the iPad actually debuted. I've had this slide for a long time now, so now it's almost seven years ago. It's not as impressive, but I can tell you when I even did it, when, it, when I presented this in, in 2013, people couldn't imagine a world before the iPad, before these touch screens. They're such a part of our lives now. But they've only been around for seven years. Uh, of course, for children, they've been around in, for the entirety of their lives. Um, and I think that this is really a game changer, and I'll spend some time talking about it, and we're doing a lot of research on it in the lab now. There's something very dramatically different about this experience with the touch screen than there is with passive viewing. And I'll contextualize it this way. What is the one thing a child never says, or never thinks, if they're preverbal? when they're using kind of old analog media, as it's now called? And, and the answer is, I did it. Because they don't do anything, right? The process of passively viewing the show or program is fundamentally passive. There's no conditional feedback of any kind. 
um, which is a very, very different experience, very different than what happens in reality, right? In reality, when you do something, they're contingent responses, whatever it is. And early TV programs recognize this, even the educational ones, they try to. Mr. Rogers would ask questions of the children who were viewing, and then, of course, because he didn't know what they answered, he would always say, that's right, <laughs> um, on the assumption that most kids were right. But, of course, they weren't necessarily right, and they were still getting the same feedback. So um, the question that comes to mind, then, is when you're comparing iPads to sort of traditional toys, are they more like a passive experience, or are they more like traditional experience of playing with toys? And I'll set up some parameters to sort of make this distinction. So you see here a column representing kind of traditional toys, the iPad, and television, or touchscreen technologies, I should say, since I'm not branding this. Um, the first is, is it reactive? Does the toy do something in response to what the human or the mm -hmm. child, uh, child does? And clearly, traditional toys and iPads have that capacity, as I mentioned. Is it interactive? Does it actually respond differently depending on what the child actually does? And, of course, traditional toys don't, right? The jack-in-the-box always pops the same way, no matter what you do. Uh, but touchscreen technologies have the capacity to be very, very different. And television doesn't do any of these things. Is it tailorable? So is it a different experience depending on the child who plays with it? So we know, or you can imagine, that an iPad game is very different for each child based on who they are and how they play with it. But the jack-in-the-box is fun, or jack-in-the-box-like toys don't really change. Is it progressive? So does it take you from one point to another and then to another? Does it constantly remember where you left off and start at that point? Again, interactive screens have that capacity. Traditional toys and TV don't. Can it promote joint attention? So we talked about joint attention. Is it a, a vehicle that can actually promote that? And of course, traditional toys surely can do that. iPad games can. I don't want to return to that. And we know from research I showed you that television has the opposite effect. It actually decreases it. Is it portable? You all obviously understand what that is. And is it three-dimensional? Um, uh, but before you take away from this talk that, you know, Dimitri said that, boy, the iPads are the greatest invention there ever was, keep in mind that the simple act of reading to a child does all of these things at no cost, and I would argue does them much better. So there's nothing, there's nothing per se magical or better about an iPad, but I just think we have to recognize that it is different than a traditional television screen. And in fact, you can see some of that here when you look at the way children interact with these screens. Um, even the three-dimensionality, which before I said wasn't present, is not even as much of an issue. Now, you might ask yourself, what does this have over just a regular coloring book? Uh, because in effect, that's what you're trying to recreate. Um, uh, and I don't know the answer cognitively, but I can tell you that the allure of this to children is much greater. If they have the choice of playing with a coloring book or an iPad, they will choose the, the iPad uh, nine times out of ten. And this is research from the zero to eight um, common sense media study. I don't know if you guys have seen this. This is the percent of children under two that have ever uh, used a mobile device in 2011 and 2013, the latest time that uh, data were available. And you can see that from 2011 to 2013, a quadrupling, almost a quadrupling of the number of children under two that had used a mobile device. Now, of course, that was four years ago, so I suspect it's even greater than that still. And you probably see it in the clients you serve and the patients you see and the families you serve that very young children, these are children under two, are on mobile devices, on mobile screens. And this is another study that was done actually in a low-income clinic in Philadelphia, so you might question the sort of generalizability of it. This is the ownership of, of, of tablets. And look here, 10% of children under the age of one own their own tablet. 20% of one-year-olds, 28% of two-year-olds, and by the age of three, 54% of children own their own tablet. This is one clinic, but it's a low-income clinic in Philadelphia. So again, remarkable penetration of this technology in very, very young children. Now, I, en I emphasized before sort of the, the conceptual game-changer that this touchscreen technology is. And I get asked all the time, I suspect some of you are going to ask me, so I'm going to cut you off now. Uh, what are good apps? Like, is there a good app that's been developed for this? And I, I never answer that question, typically, because there literally are millions of apps, and I can't profess to know them all. But more importantly, virtually none of them have been rigorously evaluated. And this is an exception. This is a program called Bedtime Math. Are you guys familiar with this? <coughs> Bedtime Math is a free app. It's one of the very few that have actually been studied very rigorously. 
And the way bedtime math works is that every day, every night, but tw every 24 hours, a new story is downloaded onto the device, um, and uh, you read it with the child. It's a very simple story. It's one screen, and um, I won't read it with you, but it, it, it talks about, in this case, pillows. And then you, ch you choose we, little, or big kids for the question you want to ask your child about it. And it's a simple math, well, depending on which one you choose, it's either simple, medium, or quote unquote hard, okay? And, and there's the question. Um, and uh, bedtime math has been studied in the University of Chicago study with 587 first graders, so keep that in mind, these are first grade children, so about six years of age, in 22 Chicago public schools. They were randomized to bedtime math or bedtime reading by app, so very good attentional control comparison, right? So they're both getting an app, one with reading, one with math. And they measured math achievement <coughs> beginning and the end of the school year. And I'll cut to the chase here very quickly. But you'll see that the math group improved much more in their math scores over the course of one year than the reading group. Both improved, as you would expect. But the math group improved much more. And notably, the improvement was much greater in children of parents who reported they were math anxious themselves. So they had difficult, they were stressed out about math. Greater improvement in those kids compared to kids whose parents reported they were less anxious. Now, if you think about what this app has done, to me, what distinguishes it is not the app that you hand to the child and you walk away, <clears throat> right? In fact, it's the opposite. And that's where I think these interactive technologies really hit the sweet spot. They create opportunities for what we call scaffolding, or what you all might call scaffolding. They structure an interaction between a parent and a child. They provide the setting to do a math problem when you might be too anxious to do it on your own. They give you all of the tools, right? They, they tee up the ball there and ask the parent to just kind of hit it. And I think that this is where these technologies really need to go. Um, this is in six-year-old children. I would think that it could be done even at younger ages. But that's not what's driving this, obviously. But I think it's something that has enormous potential. OK, what do we know about this, these interactive technologies, which are really in their infancy? The first is that infants don't really transfer knowledge from apps to the real world. Very, very young children. Um, starting at about 15 months, they can with parental reteach, which is, again, the reason I'm saying that providing that kind of structured interaction is what's key. 16 months old infants can attend and engage in joint attention during video chat with parental support. So Skyping with grandma or grandpa starting at about 16 months of age, most children will be able to get it. And 24-month-olds can actually learn words from live video chat. So that's the level that they've actually achieved. Not before then. So again, it, the video deficit, as it's called, is still there. So I, I would caution, these are a handful of small studies that have been done in laboratory settings. So there's still a lot of work to be done, particularly in naturalistic settings. <clears throat> and the final thing I want to say is that there is a serious concern that I have about these interactive technologies. And, and it really has to do with kind of what's thought of as a dopamine reward pathway. So for those of you that aren't familiar with it, basically it starts in the, in the, in the ventral tegmental area with a signal sent to the nucleus accumbens, which is experienced as pleasure. This is dopamine release to the nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens perceives that as a reward sends a signal to the prefrontal cortex that says, I like that, get more of that, do that again. It's a generic pathway, it exists, it's activated all the time. It's activated when you praise children for doing something, makes them more likely to want to do it again. It's certainly activated when they get candy, it makes them want it again. It's a generic pathway that exists in all of us. Um, but it's, it's, it's present and it's real, and as we all know, if it's activated enough, it can sort of seek, it can create kind of addictive uh, behavior. Probably you guys are familiar with the work of B.F. Skinner, who kind of outlined a lot of this stuff. And if B.F. Skinner were doing work today, it really would be using touch screens instead of beavers. And we actually are doing, believe it or not, studies with rats in the lab using touch screen iPads. They can be trained to use it. What do you suppose this toddler is going to do now with these toys that are on its? Throw it away. Throw it Right, it's going to knock them all down, and it's going to smile. And, and then, of course, the attentive parent is going to pick them up and put them back, um, and which will also result in delight. And, and, of course, what will happen next? Go on until the child's six years of age. <laughs> the truth is that is activating the dopamine reward pathway. The child's getting tremendous satisfaction from making something happen, both 
the act of dropping something and the act of the parent coming and bringing it back to them. And they'll do that in perpetuity. They really will. I mean, most parents quickly just put an end to this because they realize it's never going to end. <laughs> this is not something that's extinguishable by experience. So the concern I have about these devices is just that, that they, they do really activate that dopamine reward pathway. The I did it reaction is there kind of continuously for young children, and they can continue to sort of uh, hit it. So I hope that I've convinced you that early childhood for children and for mice is critical to their development and that children need more real-time play, less fast-time media. I, I like to say they need laps more than apps. Um, and the sort of mantra in my lab is that if you change the beginning, you change the whole story. So um, I will conclude there. This is for the medical people tomorrow. Um, I do want to say that context really matters. So. We've spent some time talking about children and screens. This is Teletubbies. It's a terrible show. Yeah. It's very popular with kids. It's actually been shown to delay language, uh, specifically this show. Uh, you single it out. Parents find it annoying anyway, but uh, it's a terrible show. Uh, but that needs to be distinguished from some of the other kinds of experiences um, that, that children and screens have. And of course, um, it's not just the amount of time. As I mentioned, it's the context. So, I often am asked, you know, is it just about time? And clearly, it's not. If I, it, this is this is even if even if they're all playing bedtime math uh, or some educational app for 20 minutes a day, this is not a, a good experience to encourage families to engage in. Okay, so there are there are ways of trying to structure the environment with media that are more positive. I want to thank everybody that supports my work. Um, my lab. I want to acknowledge my goddaughter, Caitlin, a freshman at Yale, who made it over here uh, <laughs> to, to see the talk. So thank you very, very much. I, I wanted to leave time for questions. I think I have 10 minutes or so. Thank you. George. Dimitri, so one of the things you started as a, I guess, a postulate, that, that if we look at attention, yeah. that it's not a, a binomial. It's a continuum. Right. So you actually have an experiment. And I presume these weren't ends of one, even though you even saw variants, when you had the, the mice. Yeah. No, no, no. So my question for you is, is there a continuum in the mice? You've got genetically similar mice. Do we do? You similar. can alter the environment or you can alter the genetics. So you find that continuum and what actually contributes to it? Yeah, it's, a really good, it's a really good question. So we have not, so one question, so in our currently under review grant proposal, we actually want to test exactly that sort of the dose response relationship. So I, we do it all a six hour over simulation, but the question is, is it is there if we if we do two, three, four, five, six, eight, ten, do we see a, a difference? And we're also doing the kind of um, a more sophisticated measure of attention, which is probably some of you are familiar with the, the sort of CPT test that we use in mm -hmm. kids, you know, to measure attention. There's actually you can do it in mice as well, sort of a similar version of a food reward. So yeah, no, I, I think it's a really good question. You know, the, the truth of the matter, George, is I think about this. One of the challenges when we look for effects <coughs> in children, environmental effects, is that we always look at the aggregate, right? We look at the overall effect size, and 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 then we we can measure and we try to measure as precisely as we can, and we might even find it's small, right? Like we, by by traditional standards, an effect size of 0.2 is defined as small. But the truth is, we know there's so much variability in children that really what we need to think about is that they're susceptible fractions. That if we look at the overall effect size, it might be small, but the kids who are very susceptible, we don't of course know who they are yet, and I don't know if our genomic colleagues will eventually tell us that we'll all have our DNA tested at birth and then be told what things we're at risk for and what we're not. But to be totally honest, I would argue that they're kids for whom this, these kinds of overstimulation don't matter, or don't matter that much, and they're kids for whom it matters a lot. I can't tell you who's who. Um, and in the case of the mice, genetically we don't vary them. So you're right, you can only vary yeah, these. It's the value of a continuous variable as opposed to a discrete variable. A absolutely, absolutely. And, and in fact, in an editorial I wrote around this attentional issue I, a few months ago now, I argued that a lot of things, certainly a lot of things in the psychological arena in medicine, you could even argue in the biological arena, where we draw these lines, um, does a huge disservice. And the same way we now think of autism as a spectrum, we should probably think of attentional disorders as a spectrum too. Um, it doesn't help those of us that want to decide if we treat something or not. You know, that's the way doctors think, uh, rightly or wrongly, that you have to cross the threshold and then we decide to treat you. But, but the truth is that it, it really should, a lot of things should be thought of more as continuums. Other questions? 
Yes. Um, in, in the mice, the mouse paradigm, I would assume that uh, is you know, chronically stressful for these mice and their cortisol level yeah. is probably up. Is there any evidence that kids who watch SpongeBob or Powerpuff have hormonal evidence of sort of stress, uh, things like cortisol? So two things on that. Um, first, um, we actually measured, I didn't show you this, because uh, a lot of people have attacked the paradigm saying it's stress, not overstimulation. So we looked at cortisol level in the mice, and it's not higher in the overstimulate versus the control. The other thing that's fascinating is that there are stress models in mice that have been done, actually with acoustic stress. So our, I didn't show you this, but it's less than 70 decibels, and acoustic stress models in mice subjecting them to high, to high loud sounds actually do the opposite of what we found. It actually increases their anxiety, doesn't decrease it in behavioral tests. So in truth, we're actually seeing the opposite effect of like hyper, uh, of, of, of stress, uh, both behaviorally and in terms of like their cortisol level. Cortisol level in, in babies watching, um, so no one's done what you've asked I, uh, specifically. Um, people have done, uh, Lillard in Virginia did actually exposure to SpongeBob versus, I don't know if you're familiar with this, SpongeBob versus Caillou, which is sort of a slow paced program, versus drawing and then looked at their executive function immediately afterwards, and the kids that watched SpongeBob performed worse than the slow-paced media or the drawing, brief, in immediate executive measures of executive function afterwards. We did, and I didn't show you, we did an experiment that's, because I deal with infants mostly. Here's what we did. We did bring infants um, 12 to 18 months of age into the lab and either had them watch Baby Einstein or play with blocks, and we measured salivary cortisol levels. Now. <laughs> Full disclosure, our hypothesis was going into this that we would see, this is not in the paper, so this is you're getting like the full disclosure. <laughs> our hypothesis was that it was going to be stressful for babies watching, it's going to be overstimulating, we'd see higher cortisol levels. We chose block play because, um, well, because there are no norms on infant cortisol, what is supposed, what, what is healthy or normal. We chose block play because um, Kind of a good activity. But previously, we'd actually shown that block play in that age group improves language development in a separate randomized control trial, which I didn't show you. So we wanted to use block play as the reference, and we actually thought that the baby Einstein kids were going to be higher. They're going to be more stressed watching the show. We found the exact opposite. There were statistically significantly lower cortisol levels in the babies who watched baby Einstein compared to play with blocks, which then led me to sort of do this desperate literature search ex post, if, like what the hell is going on here? And in fact, if you look at cortisol and executive function, you see it has sort of this inverted U phenomenon where very low levels are associated with poor function, very high levels are associated with poor function. There's kind of that sweet spot in between, which is really more a measure of cognitive engagement and not so much stress. So, um, and again, we don't know what those norms are, but afterwards we we're able to make perfect sense of our results because we sort of said, this cortisol level we're seeing in the block group represents what we would consider a healthy amount since it's a normal play activity and has been shown with increased language development. And the lower levels in the baby Einstein show that they're not being cognitively engaged or challenged the same way. Um, so I can, I, you can find that study if you want. That's the closest thing to what you've asked. I don't, um, but you know, the other challenge here, and it was true in Lillard's group, it's true for us, it's less true with the youngest babies, is that you know, when you bring them into the lab, you don't control for what happens outside of that. So like the kid who you bring in to watch baby, you know, SpongeBob may very well have a diet of you know, 100 hours of SpongeBob a week at home, which is already kind of adjusted their neuroendocrine axis. So, yes? I was just going to say, um, first of all, I applaud you on your, your assessment of those, um, those strange creatures that the last television show. <laughs> like Teletubbies. The name. Teletubbies, which <laughs> should never have been created. But, um, <laughs> But I just remember, and maybe my dating myself because I was a little bit older, but the very I remember the first episodes of Sesame yes. Street and falling in love with Sesame Street and loving Sesame Street. And then when their 50th anniversary came out, they put out a DVD of the original yes. Sesame Street episodes. And when you watch it, they, they first have one of these very familiar creatures come on and issue this caveat, which is, just wanted to warn you, when we created Sesame Street, the brilliant Jim Henson and Frank right. Oz and all them, that our pace was really different. Very fast. Um, it was very slow paced, it was very in, in wonderful pace, um, and that actually Sesame Street had to evolve, and they talk about, you know, the MTV world came in, um, and so everything is much more like this, and so Sesame Street itself has changed pace dramatically, 
Um, and so you think about all these other shows that have built on it and the pace has gone so quickly and sort of thinking about maybe the addictive quality to it, but gosh, how can you, I mean, I, I watch Mr. Rogers and now kids these days make fun of how slow it is and how, I mean, this guy was quite brilliant in a lot of ways, yes. So, so I think that, you know, thinking about, gosh, well, how does a teacher compete in the classroom? How do you teach in a real world way, in real time, when you can't keep up with what my generation would call the MTV pace? It's, 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 um, it's really, it's, it's an excellent question. In fact, teachers started asking that with yeah. the advent of Sesame Street. They felt they couldn't compete with Elmo, and that they, they anecdotally said that students started to come with a five-minute attention span when, when Sesame Street was born. I, I can tell you that one of the ways that teachers, I'm not a teacher, or classrooms or school systems has dealt with it is, is really kind of uh, to capitulate and to bring technology into the classroom. Um, now, I, I think to me, I get asked a lot about this, it's totally outside of my area, but I'm actually exhorting the IOM. I, I think we need like an IOM report on the role of technology in the classroom because it's, um, it is pervasive, it's growing, and it's growing for right and wrong reasons, right? I mean, I, I'm not sufficiently nihilistic or enough of a Luddite to say that keep technology out of the classroom, it can't possibly be good. That, that's not my opinion anyway. Uh, but I think that there are ways in which can, it can enhance and diminish uh, learning, and more importantly, kind of um, this development of executive function and higher order thinking. You know, I, one of the experiences for me with my children that was remarkable is that I remember so distinctly uh, my parents had, you know, in those days, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica in, in our living room. Yeah. Which represents a sizable investment. I mean, these were like immigrants. This is where they put their money. I don't know. They call. They always talk about how expensive it was. Oh, be careful. Oh, yeah. But I remember that using it as a resource. I'm sure many of you had the same experience, where you would sort of be flipping through to find what you were looking for, and find yourself kind of in that journey, reading about other things that you know either you wondered about but hadn't looked up, or just something that caught your eye, and and. You know, of course, you can't get an Encyclopedia Britannica anymore. Even you would be foolish to buy one. But, um, but, but the experience now that children have with these sort of super targeted Google searches, where they get to exactly where they want. Of course, in so many ways, it's amazing. I mean, they can get up to date information. They can get so much more information. But they they do lack that same kind of cognitive journey. Now, what is that doing to them? I don't know. But the genie's out of the bottle. I mean, there's you know, there's no going back. Um, we just have to think about how do we kind of Make sure that it doesn't that it's, that that the results are optimized and, and don't diminish them. Yes, and I, I was just going to ask you in reference to what you just said in your last slide, where you're talking about kind of the reward pathway being activated. I mean, I agree. There's nothing we can do about people having screens and classrooms, but you know, is there perhaps a case that for a certain period of a critical period during development, it, it should.